Welcome to episode 20 of our Life Group study on the Book of Romans. Before moving on, please read the passage and use the questions on your screen to generate some discussion and sharing. The passage you'll be reading today is Romans 12 verses 1 to 8, although as you shall see, we'll only deal with one verse out of there. And then the first question, if I said that God might want to give you a prophecy for harvest, how would you feel? And try to understand why you would feel that way and just share with one another. And then the second question, what is prophecy? Welcome back. I hope you had some good discussion. Let's do a short recap of what we've said already. We've learned that the gospel message demands a response. Our inner beliefs are to be reflected or expressed in outward action. How does Paul summarize this? Well, he says, firstly, offer your body as a living sacrifice. However, we need to make sure that our sacrifice is, secondly, guided by a renewed mind, a mind that is not molded by the world's patterns, but rather a mind that is constantly being renewed by the truth. So there are the two facets. Offer your body as a living sacrifice, be guided by a renewed mind. And then Paul gives us an example of what he's teaching us. The example of being a living sacrifice is service to the body of Christ. And since this is the first thing that Paul mentions, it's obviously of primary importance. Yes, we offer our bodies to God in other ways, and it would be a matter of concern if we didn't, but service of other Christians needs to be in place first of all. Think of it this way. Service of my community must start at home, and it spills outwards from there. My family, my wife and children would look at me askance if I was only serving the community but neglecting them at home. So the example of being a living sacrifice is service in the body of Christ. But how does Paul illustrate being guided by a renewed mind? What does he have in mind here? In the context of serving the body, A renewed mind is one that is not controlled by pride, but rather by sober discernment of our God-given gifts and abilities. Never forget, folks, that pride is an integral part of the world system. Remember, we defined the world system as a system that is in opposition to God. So it does not matter what you offer your body for. If pride is in control, You are conformed to the world's pattern and pride will undermine and destroy any good that you try to do. Never forget that it was pride which caused the angel Lucifer to rebel against God. So in the context of serving the body, a renewed mind is one that is not controlled by pride, but rather by sober discernment of our God-given gifts and abilities. It's also a mind that is guided by a philosophy of service which conforms to the biblical concept of the body and spiritual gifts. That has a philosophy of service guided by the biblical concept of the body and spiritual gifts. So we need to have in mind that God set things up in such a way that we are all individuals. Nevertheless, we are part of a body. Each body has different members with different gifts and abilities. Although they differ, they're still part of the same body. And we need to work in concert with that in order for things to be effective in the church. It's a bit like a rugby team. When you look at a rugby team, there are 15 men. They're all individuals. They all have different gifts and abilities, different looks, different shapes. But... They have been put by the coach into particular positions because of their unique shape and their unique abilities. So a prop is a big, heavy, strong, muscular man. He doesn't need to have particularly good ball skills. He doesn't need to be particularly fast. But if you were to put him on the wing, then he would not be in position his gifts and abilities wouldn't be suited. And it's God who decides what gifts and abilities we have and whereabouts we are put in order to use those gifts and abilities. But every member of that team, although they are individuals, still part of the same team. 
if the prop is not well and he's battling, the whole team suffers and so on and so forth. So I hope that you can see how important it is in our service, in the offering of our bodies as a living sacrifice to be guided by a renewed mind. Because if our mind is not renewed, we're not going to be able to discern, in the words of Paul, God's good and perfect will. And that means that our motivation for service, our way of serving, and the things that we eat, that we do, all of those things are going to be corrupt. Good. So now we come to a representative list of the gifts. Paul doesn't give an exhaustive list here. He gives uh, as an example, an, an, an exemplary set of the gifts. These are given by God to particular people for a particular time to serve the body. Sometimes I may be given the ability to do miraculous healing. doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to be a healer for the rest of my life. God decides. So sometimes to a particular, for a particular time to particular people, to serve the body. And so what we're going to have a look at now is the gift of prophecy. It says there in verse 6b, if the gift is prophecy, that individual must use it in proportion to his faith. Well, what is prophecy? I'm sure you had a bit of a discussion about that earlier on when I asked the question. Put very simply, prophecy is speech inspired by God. However, and there are some qualifications here. The first thing we need to know is that there are different grades of prophet. Only prophecy recorded in scripture has the same authority and inerrancy as scripture. That's the first thing to keep in mind. Therefore, prophets recorded in scripture have a different status to those referred to here although their roles and their functions do overlap. And I like to think of these as being foundational prophets. These foundational prophets were different to the kind of prophets that Paul had in mind when he was talking to the Roman church. What were the differences? Well, the foundational prophets assumed that their inspired words would be obeyed without question. Look at 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 6. This is Paul writing. He says, But we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from any brother who lives an undisciplined life and not according to the traditions they received from us. He had this awareness, along with other foundational prophets and apostles, that what he was saying, the traditions that he was passing on, the teachings that he was passing on, were inspired by God, and therefore they demanded complete, unquestioning obedience. But the prophets that Paul has in mind here, the ones that are in Rome, well, and also in other churches, uh, when you see him writing letters to other churches in, in, in um, Colosh, uh, Corinthians, for example, the, the prophets Paul has in mind must have their prophecies weighed carefully. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 29 to 33. Two or three prophets should speak. He's talking about how we should do church together. And others should evaluate what is said. Others, other who? Other prophets, other people with the gift of prophecy. And if someone sitting down receives a revelation, the person who is speaking should conclude first. And so in other words, there shouldn't be any interruptions. Why? He says, well, you can all prophesy one after another so that all can learn and be encouraged. You're not going to be to, to learn and be encouraged if you've got two people speaking at the same time. And then he, he explains why it's possible to hold on to your prophecy until the person speaking is finished. Indeed, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. In other words, a prophet can decide, I'm not going to speak this now. I can speak it in 30 seconds when the previous prophecy is finished. Why would that be the case? Why do we do it one after the other? Um, God is not characterized by disorder, but by peace. I love that. I hate disorder. I'm sure you do as well, because God is not a God of disorder. So there were prophecies given in Rome. But they didn't have the same authority as Scripture. They aren't recorded in the Bible, for example. There isn't a 67th book of the Bible with the prophecies that were given in Rome. 
Um, they were for a particular person, perhaps, or a particular group of people in the Roman church or the whole church at a particular time, in a particular place, and in a particular context, a cultural context. Nevertheless, those prophecies were inspired by God. So I hope that helps you to see that there are different grades of prophet and prophecy. Let's move on now to another question. What is the purpose of prophecy? The primary purpose, purpose of prophecy is to bring people back to God and His ways. That's the first aspect of it. We see that in the Old Testament when the prophets were continuously calling people back to God's covenant. They were saying, this is the agreement that you've entered into with God. These are the conditions of the agreement. This is the way that you should behave. This is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do. You're getting it wrong. Come back. They were restoring people to right standing with God. And it's the same under the new covenant as well. A second aspect to the purpose of prophecy is that it is to build up the body of Christ. So let's have a look at what building up is like. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 1 to 4. He says there, um, pursue love and be eager for the spiritual gifts. He's just been talking about the fact that everything, every exercising of the gift needs to be motivated by love if it is to count. Pursue love, be eager for the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For the one speaking in tongues does not speak to people but to God, for no one understands. He is speaking mysteries by the Spirit. One of the gifts of the Spirit is speaking in tongues, but it's for personal building up rather than the building up of the body unless there is an interpretation of it. Now he compares the one who prophesies with the one who is speaking in tongues. The one who is speaking in the Spirit is speaking to God. No one understands. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and consolation. And the one who speaks in tongues builds himself up. But the one who prophesies builds up the church. Then 1 Corinthians 14, 31, just a little bit further down, he says, For you can all prophesy one after another, so that, what was the purpose? All can learn and be encouraged. So the main purpose of prophecy is to bring people back to God in His ways, and it is to build up the body of Christ, and then that is qualified, that building is to strengthen, to encourage, to console, and to teach. So that's the purpose of prophecy. What, what did prophets do? Well, from examples in the Bible, we know that a prophet would do two different things. He would foretell the future, but prophecy wasn't confined to that. He would also foretell or declare what God wanted his people, what wanted to say to his people. So let's look at the first one, to foretell the future. Usually, a prophet would tell, foretell something specifically about the future, something that was going to happen, but it was usually as a warning about what would happen if Israel didn't come back to God and His ways. So he would say, come back to God and His ways, do X, Y, and Z, otherwise X, Y, and Z is going to happen to you. But if you come back, it's not going to happen. And then he would also, prophets would also foretell um, in some cases for other reasons as well. Let's look at Acts 21 verses 10 to 14. While we remain there, for a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. He came to us, took Paul's belt, tied his own, his, beg your pardon, his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says this. In other words, this is a direct declaration of God's words. This is what God is saying. It's, it's, it's inspired speech. He said, this is the way the Jews in Jerusalem will tie up the man whose belt this is, namely Paul, and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, this is Luke writing, both we and the local people, the Ephesians, um, begged him not to go up to Jerusalem. 
And Paul replied, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be tied up, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Because he could not be persuaded, we said no more except the Lord's will be done. Here's another example. Acts 11, 28 and 29. One of them, named Agabus, here he comes again, got up and predicted by the Spirit that a severe famine was about to come over the whole inhabited world. And this took place during the reign of Claudius. Now notice this. What was the purpose of this prophecy? It was requiring the disciples to respond to it. So the disciples, each in accordance with his financial ability, decided to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. They did so, sending their financial aid to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So there was this Holy Spirit, God-inspired speech. This is what's going to happen. And then the church responded to it. So the prophecy was given to build up the church because it meant that those who lived in an area that was more wealthy was able to send their money to the disciples in Judea who were much poorer so that they would have enough to live on during the famine. So foretelling the future. I hope that gives you a sense of, of what that is all about. Then there is this idea of foretelling or declaring what God wanted to say to his people. It's not specifically telling the future. And many people confine prophecy to that alone, but it's only a small part of prophecy. Declaring what God wanted to say to his people. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. Now, there were these prophets and teachers in the church at Antioch. Barnabas, called Niger, Lucius the Cyrenian, Manaen, a close friend of Herod, the Tetrarch from childhood, and Saul. While they were serving the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, once again, it's God speaking through the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the presence of God in our lives. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after they had fasted and prayed and placed their hands on them, they sent them off. And this was the start of Paul's first missionary journey. That missionary journey and the way it was conducted, namely in in a pair, in in a pair partnership <laughs> with with Paul um, and Barnabas, that wasn't decided in a business meeting. Um, that wasn't decided in some sort of missionary committee meeting. It was a gathering of the church. They were gathered together, serving the Lord, fasting, worshiping Him, and the Holy Spirit said. These are the two that I want you to send out. And then this is how I want you to do it. I want you to send them out as a pair. And then after they'd fasted and prayed, placed their hands on them, they sent them off. And folks, what a turning point in, the, in Christendom, in the life of the church. If those two hadn't been set apart and sent out in that way, I do not believe that we would have been Christians sitting here today. Now, when a person teaches the scripture, he is doing this second aspect of prophecy. He is forth telling what God wants to say to the church. So he takes a particular section of scripture and he says, this is what God wants you to know from this section of scripture. This is what God is telling us through these words. That, in a sense, is forth telling what God wants to say to the church. So this might make you think that prophecy is teaching scripture and nothing else. And there are certain um, traditions within the Christian church that believe that. But prophecy is different to teaching because teaching comes further down the list. And Paul distinguishes between prophecy and teaching. There are separate gifts. They are often used together, yes, but there is a distinction between what is prophetic, and what is teaching. So let's tie all of this together and hopefully we can make some sense and we'll use some examples. A person is being prophetic when he or she is inspired to highlight a particular biblical truth to a particular person or a group at a particular time and in a particular 
setting. This is what God wants you to know now, and this is why it's relevant. So I can remember many years ago coming in to a very difficult election season here in Zimbabwe. People were very anxious, people were very nervous, and somebody at Harvest stood up and shared from that section of scripture where the disciples were in the boat and a storm came upon them. And so he shared that story and he said, many of you feel like you are in a small vulnerable boat with a storm on the way, but don't forget who is in the boat with you. At the end of that experience, the disciples were more afraid of Jesus than they were of the storm. Why? Because Jesus was even more powerful than the storm. You are afraid of the most powerful thing. So, so don't be afraid of what's coming up ahead. F don't forget who is in the boat with you. He is sovereign over everything and anything that happens in our country. So that was an example of a prophecy. It didn't take more than a few minutes, just as I've said it, shared it with you now. Um, so a person is being prophetic when they... Um, are inspired to highlight a particular biblical truth, maybe section of scripture, to a particular person or a group at a particular time in a particular setting. Another, another way is that they can discern with God's help how a particular situation is going to turn out and therefore the best way to respond and what to pray for. So you can be sure that after Agabus uh, shared about the, the coming famine, Everybody got together and said, well, this is coming. How are we going to respond? What are we going to do? Um, and they would have prayed as well in a particular direction. To give you an example of this, um, at, at one stage, quite a long time ago now, a close friend of mine was facing um, a legal challenge. He uh, was being treated unfairly through the legal system. Somebody was bringing charges against him. And it was very, very worrying and concerning. And while I was spending time just seeking God for the situation, asking God how to pray, wondering um, what should be done, I, I, I'm not going to share the details of how it happened, but I got this very clear sense that this legal um, accusation was simply going to fall away and that nothing was going to happen as a result. And so I shared that with the person. I realized that this was God's will that um, he was saying this is what's going to happen. So I was able to pray in accordance with that. So was the person, so were some other friends that were praying for him. And it was very encouraging. And um, it brought a lot of peace to the person when they realized, look, at the moment, this might seem like the biggest challenge you're facing. But in a short period of time, it's going to be as if it never happened. It's going to fall away. And then a person is being prophetic when he can discern God's specific will for a person or for a situation. So, let's move on now to the second part of that verse, um, where it says that we must prophesy in proportion to our faith. What does Paul mean when he says that? That the gift of prophecy must be used in proportion to a person's faith. <clears throat> the original Greek is a little bit tricky here. Um, and if, if you were to translate it literally, because Greek sometimes is a very economical language, the writer will often use very few words. And so in the original Greek, if we translate it literally, um, it would be if prophecy in the proportion, the faith. If prophecy in the proportion, the faith. So when writing in Greek, Quite a lot could be implied because the writer assumes that the reader is going to use the context to supply the extra words. And so here are two possible translations. And these are ones that have been posed in, in commentaries and by biblical scholars over the years. The first one is, if the gift is prophecy, now you can see on the screen there, right, the, we, we've, the translator has supplied the words that are not there based on the context, if the gift is prophecy, that individual must use it in proportion to his faith. In other words, 
subjective. It's, it's a faith that he is experiencing, a faith that he is feeling. Or the translation could be, if the gift is, prof- if the gift is prophecy, that individual must use it, use it in proportion to the faith rather than his faith. What's the difference between the two? Well, the first one is saying that you should exercise your gift of prophecy according to the the confidence and the gift of faith that God is giving you for that particular prophecy. And so when I went to go and chat to my friend about the legal challenge, I just kind of, I, I really had this very strong sense I had faith to believe, God had somehow reassured me, and I'm not sure how he did it, that this was going to go away. And so that was why I responded in the way I did, because I was, I was sure that this is the way it was going to turn out. So that's the one possible interpretation. The other possible interpretation is that if we're exercising prophecy in proportion to the faith rather than our faith, then we're saying that this prophecy must mustn't contradict the faith. It mustn't contradict the Christian faith. It must line up with biblical truth. And so you can see why people have debated over the years. Both of them actually fit pretty well. Um, I'm, I've always said that obviously prophecy needs to line up with scripture. It needs to line up with the faith. I think that's just an assumption. It would be God doesn't con- contradict himself. So I'm inclined to go for the first one. Um, and I've just on occasions learned um, to, to gauge the, the faith with which I'm receiving something from God. Um, and the reason why I've learned is because I've learned from past experience. Well, this was how I felt and this was my experience and this was how it turned out. And for example, um, someone, someone that we know who's very close to us was very, very sick in hospital with COVID. And uh, they had an elderly person, they had been on a, on a respirator for like 10 days, and usually that meant the person was going to die. But the one day, suddenly I just got this very clear sense, Ian, pray for this person to, to be healed and to live, because they are going to kind of come through this. And um, looking back, that was from God, because they were, they, they did come through it. And they're still alive today, Um, whereas the circumstances seem to indicate that they were going to pass on. Now, where do we prophesy and who can prophesy? Well, first of all, prophecy is not confined to the pulpit. Since Paul distinguishes prophecy from preaching in his lists of spiritual gifts. So that's how we know that it's not confined to the pulpit. Therefore, it's not only for pastors and elders. Prophecy is not only for pastors and elders. When does it happen? It happens, according to Paul, in 1 Corinthians 14, it happens when you come together. Prophecy can be given to both men and to women. There are instances in the Bible where the Bible refers to woman as having the prophetic gift. For example, there was an evangelist called Philip and his daughters had the prophetic gift. And then lastly, prophecy is not confined to Christian gatherings only. And there are instances in the Bible, for example, where Jesus used the prophetic gift in the way that he related to that Samaritan woman at the well. So we would like these things to happen at harvest. We'd like to happen on a Sunday. Now, there do need to be some boundaries um, because our Sunday services are public. They're open. Anybody can drop in. So we always have, as a a protection, um, the guideline that anyone who wants to share a prophecy needs to check with the person leading the service, usually a pastor who's leading the service. They should check with them in advance uh, or actually check with them in the service. And this means that the word can be weighed up and evaluated. It also means that it protects you 
from possibly making a mistake because you're doing it in conjunction with someone who has responsibility for the service. And then what we'll also say is that once the prophecy is given, we, it, it, it in a sense will be tested again. Was there anything in that that just didn't seem to ring quite true? Maybe some other spiritual gifts will come into that. For example, the spiritual gift of discernment. Was that from God or wasn't it from God? Was it the inspired word God or word of God or not? Um, and then we'd also like it to happen in life groups as well. And then, of course, in outside, outside of organized church gatherings in your day-to-day -day life. Just be waiting on God. God may give you a particular scripture. And just, this is God's inspired word for this person at this time in the situation that they're going through. And you know what? Even if you, if you made a, a slight mistake and it wasn't the, the, what, what God had on his mind, if you give him a scripture, it doesn't matter anyway because it is still God's inspired words. So, let's just conclude here. God has a particular way that he wants us to do church. There's a particular way in which he wants us to relate to one another, to serve one another. And it has to do with this way of being part of a body, individual members of one body, with each member being given different gifts to serve the body. Remember, a gift is not something in your hands for yourself. A gift is something in your hands, is in something in your hands to pass on to other people. So we want to try as best as possible to fit in and to line up with God's way of doing things because that's the best way of doing it. And we want to follow that at harvest. Just to, to, to finish off today, um, here are some final questions for discussion. Has the way that you feel about prophecy changed as a result of this teaching? Why has it changed? And would anyone like to share about an experience of receiving a prophecy? So just hit pause and, uh, and answer those questions. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. And we look forward to being with you again in the near future. Goodbye for now.